Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm Sarah Traver, I'm the director of Traver Gallery here in Seattle, and I am very pleased to be here with our featured artist, Preston Singletary. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, Preston is uh, known around the world for his contemporary work in glass using very traditional clinket designs um, and incorporating the traditional clinket stories into the glass medium. Um, Preston, uh, thanks again for showing with us. It's awesome to Thank you. have your work in the gallery. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this show and your inspiration and some of the work in it? Yeah. So the, the show title comes from this um, musical piece that I do with my band, which is with the other, my uh, Moonlight as a Musician. So this was a, uh, a lyric from a, well, well, actually a spoken word piece, the place where you go to listen. And for me, that just kind of, um, that's what I took as inspiration to, you know, as I'm looking at the next 10 years of my career, I'm starting to like think about the things that I want to do and, and really um, hone in on the stuff that I would like to accomplish over the next 10 years. Um, and so this piece, um, the second piece, which is uh, called uh, Unassimilated, was another, uh, taken from another song in our group, another spoken word piece called um, Earth Prayer. And it's a story about how Raven goes uh, away, comes back after a long journey, and instead of tall trees, he sees all these buildings and he doesn't really understand the landscape, you know, where he came from or his, you know, his family comes from. So um, he then discovers this log that's been washed up from, you know, from onto the beach and it's really heavy with all the salt water and the metaphor of that is, you know, the, the sorrow that, you know, that the, the natural world is, you know, quickly disappearing for Raven and so um, hmm. the sun is kind of warming this log and then drawing it out and so he's sitting on this log and in the story he starts to cry with the log. One of the things that you've been talking a little bit about to me um, is this idea of how to bring these traditional stories um, to a contemporary audience. Mm -hmm. um, is this an example of that or? Yeah, I mean, this is this is like, um, you know, based on the music that I was doing, uh, based on my whole thought process, you know, trying to identify the new uh, new stories of Raven. And, you know, if the culture had continued the way it was prior to contact, you know, you would imagine that there would be all kinds of new stories that were being made yeah. that would, you know, rep but you know, if we look at and we think about Raven in the, as a spirit in the world somehow, that maybe he's still trying to affect changes within the within the world, uh, positive changes. I like to think so. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to be the next chapter. So we'll have to stay tuned yeah. for that. Cool. Well, let's look at some of the other work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these were the, um, I've done these before. There was a lot of questions at the opening about the lidded baskets. And they are, um, you know, a little oversized for what they were traditionally. Often they were very small um, uh, baskets with lids, but just kind of a fun um, expansion on the basket forms. Um, I, I love the, the kind of the circular design on the top. Yeah, it's I've really beautiful. I've seen examples of, you know, curio shops where these um, were stacked up on edge and, you know, kind of like pyramid, in like a giant pyramid. And so that's <laughs> where I took a lot of inspiration for those, those lidded, uh, or the designs on the lids. Yeah, uh, and these lids do come off, right? Yeah, yeah, they, they're, uh, they're fitted for, it's beautiful. Um, so they actually function as a, as a, well, a storage container if you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then this is a beautiful piece, Thunder Being. Yeah, so based on a Thunderbird, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've done some of these kinds of um, compositions, but I've made eagles and ravens, and so I decided that I had never made, well, I haven't made Thunderbirds very often, but they are, 
Um, you know, I, I don't know a whole lot about the, um, I, there, it, it is a clan, uh, the Thunderbird clan. Hmm. And, you know, in the southern version of the Thunderbird, it, you know, these, these birds were mythological creatures that were so large they could pluck whales out of the ocean. Wow. I don't think it's the same up in Clinkett territory, but it, um, in any case, what we do know is that they were, uh, they flapped their wings at sort of where the thunder sound comes from. Um, kind of a little bit of a generic uh, explanation, but these, it was, uh, it was fun kind of working on this composition and trying to make this, uh, make this creature. Yeah, and then beside it here, and I love the um, these pieces next to each other because you have this sort of mm -hmm. repeated form here. Um, this is oh, a, yeah. the yeah. screen that you've done um, in collaboration with another gallery artist, Dick Weiss. Dick Weiss, yeah. And, and yeah, so Dick and I are uh, old, old friends, uh, go way back into the 80s. Um, and at one point I lived in his house. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so, you know, he proposed the idea of doing a collaboration. I had some ideas of putting some kind of abstracted form line and also a bit of a river theme. Mm -hmm. um, so it's supposed to you know, give the, the feeling of a, you know, flow of water. And so working with Dick, he's got, um, you know, uh, he, this is his, his wheelhouse. So I let him um, help kind of dictate some of the uh, the details and the glass that was used and what have you. So he, uh, he's been busy working on these things and they're, they're fun to have. Yeah, they're beautiful pieces. Um, so they're, it's leaded glass and uh, Dick typically uses glass from various sources. Some of it is yep. um, from friends that are glass blowers yep. that maybe have a piece that didn't work out, and so he'll use a section of that. Other pieces are antique glass. Other pieces are glass that, for like architectural use, you mm -hmm. know. So, um, a really beautiful array of things there. Yep. Great. Um, well, this is one of the. Um, this is one that I gave the title, The Place Where You Go to Listen. And this is like a shaman figure. So he's kind of an emaciated shaman. He's kind of uh, um, yeah, going through some kind of experience. <laughs> um, I mean, the shaman on the Northwest Coast would, you know, live in isolation and do extreme sort of rituals and uh, fasting and, you know, to sort of connect themselves to the spirit world and help lead the community and the tribe. Uh, uh, the tribe, um, and I put him on this oyster catcher rattle. So this is a, this is a mountain goat, and this is the oyster catcher here. Um, it's kind of based on a traditional rattle that, uh, you know, lots of varieties of uh, exist of this kind of form. But now I'm kind of reinterpreting it and um, creating it as a sculpture. So you've incorporated real feathers in this piece. Um, yeah. Are those, I know in some pieces you've used feathers from your father's um, fly tying tackle box. That's right. Is that That's right. what exactly. these are from? Yeah. I have a, a, a giant box of, of feathers that my father would use to uh, tie flies with. And so I was, you know, putting these into the sculptures now because um, it's such a variety of of feathers that that he left that I um, I like to I like to work with them when I can. Yeah, and speaking of feathers, the piece next to it here is a feather form. Yeah, uh, a little different from some of the feathers that we've shown previously in the gallery in terms of mm -hmm. scale, and then also um, this is actually a blown form. Yeah, so this is um, uh, made from a blown bubble rather than a solid uh, solid bits of glass, which are typical of the other feathers I've done. So I was trying to get a bigger scale um, mm -hmm. with this and just, um, yeah, it was just, I had a, a, on a whim, I decided to make a piece like that. It uh, was really fun to, to try out. It's the only one that I've made so far. It's beautiful. The color on that piece is um, 
is subtle and maybe it doesn't come through very well on the camera, but when the when it gets a little light behind it, mm -hmm. it just absolutely illuminates. It's yeah, there's a transparent gray under there, and so it's kind of tone on tone. It's supposed to be uh, a subtle kind of effect is what I was going for. Yeah. So it, it also kind of relates a little bit to argillite, you know, the hmm. Ida, mm -hmm. you know, stone carvings, yeah. you know, that are all, you know, black slate material. Um, so I kind of like to think of it that way too. Yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's always uh, kind of, um, you know, working with earth tone colors, you know, I did that for so long and then I finally tried to break out of my color rut and start making, you know, work with some of these brighter colors, but it makes everything a little bit different, a little bit more contemporary, I think. Yeah, it does. I mean, and, um, and you'll, we see as we're walking through the show, there's actually quite a bit of bright color in here as well. Um, yeah. But, or bright colors mixed with earth tones, you know, there's mm -hmm. these really beautiful, yeah. subtle combinations. Yeah, a couple of amulet forms here, obviously more of a bear's tooth, and this is kind of like a bone or a piece of, uh, or a prunt of some sort that could have been typically used, uh, I mean, on a smaller version, might have been used as a little, you know, necklace or amulet. Mm -hmm. um, but these ones are um, kind of the newest offering of that, that variety. And using some, um, for glass enthusiasts that are watching, using some different techniques here too. So mm -hmm. like using some Encolmo here to create yeah. different layers of colors within the piece. Yeah, so there was a two, two different bubbles of glass that have been uh, separated from the top and the bottom. And then this area, the black and uh, red was uh, join together as a band and then continue the shaping process, uh, sculpting and shaping is how we got that effect. Um, I was trying out some, I mean, I like, I like the variety and just trying to mix it up, you know, yeah. with, uh, as far as the presentation and the effect go. Yeah, it's neat too how there, it goes from this transparent to totally opaque to back to transparent. It mm -hmm. kind of creates this kind of shroud around the middle. Pretty. Yeah, it's kind of like the unassimilated one where you've got the, the color fade from one to the one mm -hmm. color to the next. I mean, I'm trying to figure out new color techniques that can, I don't know, break yeah. out, you know, make more var variations. I guess kind of like this one too. This was another Encalmo technique. Um, where you know they were joined at one point they were joined together in this direction but then i switched the axis and stretched it out so it became uh, more of a side by side uh, uh, in calmo and working with those contrast of colors you can create different effects and different um, animal symbols yeah. Preston, you've been getting a lot of attention this last year. It's been a really significant year in your career with the Smithsonian Show, uh, which yep. is now at the Chrysler Museum. Mm -hmm. um, the, there was a piece on CBS Sunday Morning. I think you got a big award from Artist Trust. That's um, right. Lots of different things happening. Um, what's on the horizon? What are you working on now and looking well, forward to? Let's see. Um, been doing a lot of music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Back to the music. Um, we What's were, the name of your band, just so folks we, can find we, it? Yeah, right, right. So w the group is called Kuik. Uh, it's spelled K-H-U-E-E-X. Uh, it means potlatch in the Klinkit language. And in this, uh, let's see, in February, we recorded some soundtrack material. There's been a, a documentary film that's been more or less 10 years in the making. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so we made the, the soundtrack material, but we also recorded another album. We have one that's been delayed by COVID. So we've got basically four albums coming out. Oh, wow. In the next uh, okay. <laughs> year, year, ongoing yeah. year. Um, and this documentary film should be done, I think, hopefully by the fall. Um, mm -hmm. And that will be a good um, 
thing to, to wrap up after all this time. And, uh, but then work-wise, um, yeah, just kind of going into the, the studio with these new ideas yeah. and trying to bring, thinking about trying to bring more detail into the work yeah. and, and kind of, you know, take more time and do um, different kinds of detailings, you know, mm -hmm. like this in Calmo, you know, the different, yeah. to get a different effect. Yeah. So that's been kind of my objective. Um, and then a few public art things on the horizon that'll be put up. There's one going up in fr uh, this Friday in uh, a retirement community called Panorama. And it'll mm. be a series of panels that have steel and glass and lights inside. Is that here it. in the Northwest? It's down near Tacoma. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, then we're going to install at the Microsoft campus some of these giant raven uh, sculptures on these poles, mm. uh, kind of flying through the campus, and uh, that'll be uh, that'll be this summer. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, then later in the fall, the museum show will travel to Oklahoma. Oh, wonderful! Yeah. Okay, and it'll be opening in November, uh, and so. Yeah, so that's going to happen. And in between, we're going to try to squeeze in a, uh, Dante and I are going to travel to Czech Republic and do some that's work right. over I there. Heard, mm -hmm. I so, heard about that. So uh, that's, uh, that'll be a fun, you know, um, adventure. We always, we always have time, uh, a fun time traveling together. Yeah. And, so. on, and then on top of all of that, <clears throat> I think you're working on a book. Oh, that's true. <laughs> 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 yeah, so this book is, is kind of, um, I don't know. It's not. It's not a proper. It's not an autobiography. It's not a memoir. It's just kind of like notes to the memoir, mm -hmm. so to speak. And it talks a lot about my, um, well, you know, kind of how I got involved with glass and you know, the, the my journey as an artist, so to speak, as yeah. a, uh, as a glass artist and musician, and the things that you know kind of fuel my creativity. I guess that's that's that sums it up pretty good. Yeah, I mean that's actually maybe a nice segue. Um, one of the one of the wonderful things about this exhibition is it's actually paired alongside another exhibition, which is um, a, a memorial exhibition for Tony Hohola. Mm -hmm. And Tony was um, one of the very first Native artists to start using glass. That's right. Um, and do you want to just talk a little bit about your relationship yeah. and who he so, was? Yeah. So I, I met Tony in 1984. This is the first time I ever went to Pilchuck um, and he and Larry Avocano were there there's two native artists and me I wasn't really doing native art at the time I mm -hmm. was just learning how to blow glass but I met those guys and I think somehow they kind of planted a seed in my head hmm. this could be a direction I mean I was it was really fascinating to meet them both because Larry being from Alaska was uh, and he's in Yupiat um, and then Tony is from the Pueblos, mm -hmm. uh, Isla de Pueblo, and so he was there on, you know, and had been working with glass, and he was uh, just, you know, a really, really sweet person, really, really uh, nice yeah. guy, and I really had, uh, got to know him well. In fact, we had kind of back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back birthdays. It was me, and then Lino, Salia Pietra, and mm -hmm. then Tony. So every year we would, I would get a phone call from Tony. He right. would call me every year just to say happy birthday. <laughs> and knowing that I was probably going to see him down in Santa Fe. Um, uh, Which every, would be right around the same time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like just a few days later. Um, but we, yeah, so we um, always connected. He, he came up and worked with Dale quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back up to Pilchuck, he was teaching at Hilltop. And so... I can't say enough about him because he was just such a great um, teacher, really good with kids. He really inspired the kids. He worked really well with them. He knew how to kind of like get into their mindset hmm. and, and people felt comfortable around him. And he was just such an amazing energy and uh, person to be around. And so yeah. uh, definitely uh, he'll be very missed because of his... Uh, you know, his legacy as one of the pioneers of, you know, for Native American yeah. uh, glass blowers um, mm -hmm. and, you know, all of that 
you know, we just, he just, we lost him way too soon. Yeah, absolutely. It was really um, striking what an impact he made. Uh, we had a celebration here the other night mm -hmm. um, for the opening of the shows. And, um, and the show is really built around uh, looking both at his art that he created, yep. but also the art that he influenced by yeah. his work as a teacher and a mentor. Yeah. Um, and it's really impactful. It's really. Yeah. I mean, the fact that he grew up on the reservation too, and then went to Santa Fe and learned about glass blowing, but then made his way up here. So he left his community to, to discover the glass. And I mean, so for me, it was, you know, glass kind of grew up around me mm -hmm. and he went to seek it out. And that was pretty radical at the time. A lot of the people who grew up on the Pueblo, they, they stay really close and they don't. I remember him telling me that, you know, that, that some of the, some of the tribal members kind of distrusted him. Like, well, why do you got to go? Why do you have to leave? Why are hmm. you leaving us? Mm -hmm. you know, why, you know, isn't this enough for you? And He's, he, he, it was his calling to go and, and explore glass. And so, um, but he was always, he was a very traditional guy. I mean, it, it was, when hunting season came, he was absolutely gonna go hunting and there's no, <laughs> no two ways about it. Yeah. Um, so he, I, I love thinking about that and who he was because he, um, you know, he, he had this foot in two worlds, right. you know, and uh, pretty an amazing guy. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I hope that everybody is able to check out the that exhibition as well. It's um, there's a wonderful little YouTube that we did with John Drury, the curator of that, um, which you can find on our YouTube channel too. Mm -hmm. um, and Preston, I don't know if you want to talk about any of the other pieces here. Um, oh, let's I know. See, I know there was a question about the seal. Yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of. Um, you know, this is more of a anatomical seal, uh, but typically these were used or made as grease dishes. So the, the, the seal uh, was, um, they would make seal oil mm -hmm. um, and then they would make a dish kind of like you dip your dried fish into it. So this isn't, you know, interpreted as a dish. It's more of a sculpture, mm -hmm. uh, but that is kind of what the seal means to the community. Um, you know, it was, hunted, it was, they would eat them. Yeah. Um, and um, I mean, I've tried it uh, myself, but I wouldn't call it my new favorite dish. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very strange. It, it actually tastes very fishy, even though it's hmm. got a fleshy kind of texture to it. Um, but anyways, that's, that was my um, homage to a, a seal. Yeah, it's a beautiful new Spirit piece. Spirit of the sea, I called it. And how about the piece next to it? This is a piece that you did in um, collaboration with another artist, yeah. Lisa Telford. Yeah, so it's funny that I, I always meant to say something. This is actually the back side of the dress. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually has more interesting details going on. So she's kind of looking at the wall <laughs> that's here. Um, this is called Foam Woman, and this is uh, this weaving was done by Lisa Telford, and she's a Haida uh, weaver, traditional cedar bark and well spruce root cedar bark weaver. Um, and she's a good friend of mine. Uh, I've known her for years. Uh, we've been in many different, um, you know, uh, cultural gatherings together, and um, and we actually made this along. Uh, I don't know, probably about seven or eight years ago. Hmm. And I finally decided, okay, I'm gonna finally finish the piece. So Foam Woman is uh, this uh, mythological uh, person who, ha uh, you know, if you think of the foam that, the sea foam that gathers at the beach, you know, on the edge of the beach, this is where Foam Woman kind of grew out of. And when I was reading about it, um, it said that she has multiple breasts and was able to nurture the, the clans. Um, so hmm. she's often regarded as, as, uh, as origin stories around the clans hmm. and she cre as, as if she cr created the clan mm -hmm. system. Um, and so um, here we've got her clothed up in cedar bark and mm -hmm. she's rising up out of this, uh, out of this watery base here. It's a beautiful piece. It's a very different feel. Yeah. So it's kind of a collaboration uh, with Lisa. Yeah. I hope Lisa gets to see it. <laughs> 
How about the, um, the red eagle piece here in the back? Yeah, this is kind of, um, uh, again, kind of like that uh, interpretation of the Thunderbird with the wings, this, you know, working with different uh, um, compositions around this. But this is um, Eagle Boy, and so this is kind of uh, this boy down here that is um, the eagle uh, in this particular story um, was uh, dropping fish to this boy, hmm. and he was kind of um, he was kind of an outcast. But the 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 um, uh, the village was experiencing famine, and so he brought these salmon to the people, and so more and more fish were delivered by the eagle, and so he created this kind of relationship with him. Hmm with this eagle and so in the end he was allowed back into the community <laughs> and was kind of celebrated as a um, you know, uh, unique individual who helped save the, the village from star uh, starvation. Beautiful story. It's such a powerful piece that um, that sort of orangey red color is mm -hmm. really striking and different. Yeah, yeah, that's, that one turned out to be pretty uh, punchy in its color. Yeah. And then another beautiful form here. This one's also really beautiful color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is another kind of, um, you know, it's kind of like a sh uh, an amulet, like one of the prunt forms, but I wanted to create a little bit more of an organic um, shape. And then this kind of refers back to my modernist influences when mm -hmm. I think about uh, um, Brancusi or Noguchi or somebody, you know, like that, making these, you know, very kind gestural of bird kind of and forms. space, yeah, kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but then I put these, you know, kinds of, you know, put like a, a raven here, and then this little human figure, kind of is. I don't know what's going on here, but there's uh, uh, stillness was the title, and that was also. Um, where the title of the show comes from, that song we called uh, uh, Stillness. Mm -hmm. um, the place where you go to listen, and it kind of talks about, in the story it kind of talks about this person who's going out into nature and looking for, you know, kind of a meditative yeah. space, and then kind of divining uh, sort of creative thoughts. Yeah, there's yeah. a number of really meditative, quiet pieces in this show. I really mm -hmm. like that. Like they allow for kind of an introspective space. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, there's, I think it's always present in your work, a narrative or an implied narrative, but some of these pieces, and I think this yeah. one's a great example of that is really um, also just about the form and the design and mm -hmm. the it's not so much about a particular story yeah. necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I like to leave them up open for interpretation in some cases. And, you know, my, one of my uncles, uh, my uncle Larry, <laughs> was my, my middle name is Lawrence. So mm -hmm. I was named after my uncle and he was, um, he was a big advocate of mine. And he asked me early on, you know, do you ever write poems hmm. for your pieces or you know or, or I wasn't really making work at that time but when we were talking about it and he was encouraging me he was not Clinkett but he was uh, married into you know to my aunt who mm -hmm. is and you know he was an engineer and very um, creative thinker and and he was really excited that I was you know endeavoring to do this and he gave me a lot of ideas and I think a lot of the, the titles that I've been doing for years are reflective of those kinds of non sequitur kind of random titles that <laughs> leave, you know, leave it open to interpretation. Yeah. Um, they kind of prompt people to think. Yeah, because, you, know? you, know, you know, every time, I mean, sometimes I'll go in with a very specific idea of what I want to do and what story I want to tell or what, how it's going to look, and then sometimes I'll just start, you know, putting lines down on a piece and I turn it, and okay, then I can start to, it gives me a guideline to, yeah. to start to um, get into that zone of just drawing and making the lines flow together yeah. and that so you know that's how that's how things come together for me yeah thanks Preston mm -hmm. um, you're giving a talk at Town Hall tonight that's um, right which 
uh, obviously will be passed by the time people watch this video, but <laughs> I'm sure it will be available online for people to watch. Yep. And then we're doing an, um, an in-person artist talk as well, which we'll try and do some video of too. Mm -hmm. So that'll be available for folks to watch as well. Yep. Um, thank you. It's All really right. awesome to hear about the work and beautiful show. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.